with the leaves falling and the days growing shorter and darker, it's time to start preparing our boats for the winter months. The first concern is to make sure the boats are properly anchored. We have several large anchors thrown in all directions. So what we're checking at this stage is simply if the lines are intact, that they're not tangled up or anything like that. And once we made sure we won't be blown away by a strong fall storm, our main focus is to make sure the heating systems are working properly. In our case we have two wood pellet stoves. They're perfect if you don't want to feed in firewood every two hours. Instead you'll be spending that time cleaning the machine, troubleshooting error codes and refilling pellets. The downside of pellet stoves is that they require a specific type of pellets. And unlike regular firewood, pellets don't just grow on trees. So for this winter, we invested heavily in pellets and bought an entire metric ton. When it comes to electricity during the darker seasons, here we have to rely more and more on power from a generator. As our solar panels simply cannot provide the needed energy with the sun becoming more and more scarce. I check different battery banks daily to see which ones need charging. I even check inside the boats we don't currently live in because dealing with a dead battery is really annoying. My lithium battery can easily be checked through an app which is the most convenient of them all. Sadly, the boat generator I bought earlier this year is still without function. So I had to get one of those modern gasoline inverter generators. The past weeks I've also been quite busy tidying up the new barracks boat. And oh boy, did we clear out a lot of junk from that boat, which we then had to painstakingly haul to the recycling center, boatload after boatload. We've pretty much emptied the little storage rooms in the bow and stern, which allows us to store our pallets in one of them. We already managed to turn the forward room into a livable guest room and I know it currently looks more like a prison cell, but we're working on that. Now with all this prepping, I didn't get around to much construction and I didn't buy a new boat. Well, at least not a big one. I did pick up a small American-made aluminum boat from the 1960s, but we'll have to save that story for another time. Instead today, I want to show you how I've started finishing the areas surrounding the windows on my barge boat liveaboard slash party boat. Here, you'll remember, we still have large gaps where the construction wood and building foam are exposed. This gives everything an overall unfinished and unappealing look, so it's high time we change that. I got these pre-cut strips of very thin MDF boards. They're smooth on the front side and rough on the back. To start, I'm going to cut the strips to fit precisely over the open areas. Of course the strips weren't quite long enough to cover the entire length of the window, so I had to piece them together in a bit of a patchwork. Once all four sides were covered, I went ahead and cleaned the MDF strips, removing any rough edges to ensure they fit together more seamlessly. I applied regular wood stain to the back of the MDF plates and used the same grey paint I used for the exterior of my barge boat for the front of the strips. Next I cut several short pieces from a wooden beam to cover the large space beneath the window, creating a sturdy, even surface to attach the MDF strips. I glued them in place with fast curing construction adhesive. Before moving on, I'm going to prepare the areas on the left and right of the windows. Now that the little wood blocks are in place, I'm going to cover the area with cardboard and then apply a generous amount of construction foam so it's probably going to get messy. I find working with construction foam rather difficult as I can never seem to apply just the right amount. It's either too little, leaving some areas uncovered, or too much so it ends up overflowing. And sure enough, the same thing happened this time. 
Naturally, my little cardboard wall didn't hold back a thing. But after trimming away the excess foam with a large kitchen knife, it turned out not that bad. By now the painted strips are also ready, so it's time to put them in place. Here, I'm using the same fast curing construction glue, which is proving to work really well for this application. Next I'm adding a few short wood blocks above the window. In the meantime, while that cures, I can go ahead and attach the side pieces. And just like that, the frame is finished. And with this for the first time, with all the rough construction elements concealed, it finally gives the impression of a completed space. Next I'm going to tackle the other types of windows, here, the gaps to cover are much smaller. I couldn't find anything that would fit perfectly into this gap, so I got this flexible skirting board. And after cutting it in half, I ended up with two strips that were the exact width I needed. Before gluing these strips in place, I need to clean up all the gaps by cutting away the protruding plastic spacers and sanding down the construction foam. Now I can attach the strips, which is fairly easy, since they're self-adhesive. However, the adhesive wasn't strong enough on its own, so I ended up using the same construction glue for extra hold. Next I tackled the front doors. Then I moved on to the long horizontal forward facing windows. And so with that let's take a look at the final result. Now as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this isn't a major construction project, but as small as it might seem, it makes a huge difference in the appearance of our walls, finally giving the interior a hint of being finished. I'm sure many people, myself included, had started to lose hope that this would ever happen. I'm also planning to add some covering strips along the base of the walls. For now I've just set them in place without gluing them down, but even so, you can already see the huge difference it makes. So let's take a moment to enjoy a few more shots of this semi-finished look, knowing there are plenty of areas where the appearance could be even further improved. For example by covering the gaps with filler paste, then sanding everything down, and giving it a final smooth paint job. I'll probably do that sometime in the future, but for now I want to move on to something different. Namely, I want to show you how I started setting up a little service cabinet behind the area where our future kitchen will be. By the way, the area covered by the black drapes is where our future bathroom will be, so you can see there's a lot going on in the future, but for now let's focus on this very current project building the service cabinet mainly for our water system in the small space behind the kitchen and bathroom. But first a word from today's sponsor, Creality, a leading global manufacturer of 3D printers and laser cutters and engravers. They sent me their latest flagship laser cutter and engraver, the Falcon 2 Pro. Very easy to set up as it comes mostly pre-assembled. It's the first 60 watt fully integrated laser machine. Its 60 watt laser has the mightiest cutting ability, allowing for higher working efficiency. Thanks to its intelligent 3 level adjustment beam, you can switch between 22 watt, 40 watt, and 60 watt with a single push of a button. To demonstrate this, I engraved three fields with the same settings in Lightburn only switching between the three different power modes by pushing a button on the laser directly and you can see on our workpiece that we clearly get three different results. It comes with a built-in camera for auto positioning allowing you to precisely work on parts of any shape or material. The provided enclosure makes working safe and efficient. The built-in fan swiftly clears away smoke from the enclosure, ensuring a clear workspace for precise results. 
The integrated light strip provides perfect illumination, ensuring you always have a clear view of your work. Plus, you'll receive a bonus 1.6 watt laser module to achieve precise engraving for photos. Air Assist allows for cleaner, better work results. The metal drawer design allows you to safely and easily retrieve your workpiece and debris. With the powerful 60 watt laser module, you can cut through up to 20 mm plywood in a single pass or run ultra fast batches, saving you valuable time on every project. You can even engrave and cut stainless steel up to 0.3 mm thick in a single pass. I use it to create stunning custom signs such as this one that add a unique touch to the interior of my event boat. To make it, I first created a template of the sign in Lightburn. I then went ahead and did a series of tests to figure out the best settings for cutting the plywood and then later the acrylic. Once I found the right settings, I first made a tiny sample before going for the full-sized model. Now in this case, the full-sized version is still a bit smaller than what I would actually do because raw materials, especially acrylic, are quite expensive and I don't want to waste too much in case things wouldn't work out. So for now, I'm just making a small prototype of the sign I want to make. Luckily, it all went well and so once I had all my parts, I could go ahead and assemble the sign. So here is the finished prototype and the idea for the final version is to leave some space to include an LED light and to illuminate the sign directly. Whatever your ideas are, the Falcon 2 Pro 60 Watt Laser Cutter and Engraver is here to bring them to life. To find out more, click the link in the description. I start by cutting some wooden beams to make a frame for the cabinet structure. I'm using pine laminated beams for the front part, matching the look of our floor and I use much cheaper regular pine wood for the areas that won't be visible once it's finished. I begin by building two frames, one from the nicer pine laminated wood and the other from the regular pine wood. For each joint I use two long wood screws to ensure a sturdy connection. After positioning the front frame and securing it temporarily, I can start building the second frame in the same way. After confirming it fits properly, I take it back out and add a couple of supporting beams for extra stability. I generally use long wood screws and countersink them deep enough to insert a wooden dowel, effectively hiding the screw for a cleaner look. I don't usually do this with the regular wood, but I'll show you in a moment how it looks with the nicer wood. For now, let's put the finished rear frame in place. With the two frames in place at the rear and front, I can now attach the side beams. Now let me take this opportunity to demonstrate how I'll hide the screw holes using 10mm dowels. This is now ready to be sanded down further until the dowels eventually blend in seamlessly with the rest of the wood. One of the biggest lessons I learned when building the floor is that whatever you're building, it's always good to have a box of these little plastic spacer strips as they are not only useful for aligning different pieces of wood while drilling and screwing them down, but they are also handy if a mistake is made, such as here, where someone cut this piece of timber too short, so now I can use this spacer to fix it. Moving on to attaching the final horizontal beams here at the top. Next I'm going to install a tabletop, or you could call it a shelf floor, for this I'm using the same wood we used for the floor, namely the film-faced plywood plates made of birch wood. I want to make the shelf floor flush with the wooden side beam to give it the same look as the floor. I'm drawing a line underneath the plate with a sharp pencil. I then add a wooden beam as a guide. Next I use the milling tool to cut away the excess material.
Then I add a small frame as a border for the plate to rest on. I double check to see if the plate fits perfectly and it does. Then I add another frame at the rear so the plate is supported across the entire length, at least on one side. I use fairly thick screws in this area because why not? And with that the plate is ready to go in. Unfortunately the wood is a little distorted. So I'll drill through the frame to secure the plate from below, ensuring there are no marks on the top side. Now I can position the plate one last time and screw it down securely. And with that, the main frame of our shelf is finished. And I'm very happy with how it turned out. Sure, I had to cheat a little in some areas, but since this shelf will be hidden from view, I don't really mind. To cover the rear side of the upper area, I chose a relatively thick wooden plate as the devices we'll be attaching to these boards can be quite heavy. Next I cut away the corners on two boards so they can sit flush against the sides. To cover the gaps between the boards and help hold them in place I'm using these wooden strips. Here I simply drill a few holes into them I countersink those holes With those I can lock the wooden plates in place while also giving it a nice finished look Next I'm going to add a few screws to the sides and with that our service cabinet is ready to take on the first devices. Eventually I'm considering adding sliding doors and I'll probably turn this into a small wardrobe as well. But for all that you'll have to wait for the next update.